I'm Agnieszka Niemark and this is the Boyce Thompson Institute Centennial Oral History Project. It's November 27, 2023. Uh, I'm today with Claire Castile, Associate Professor of Plant Pathology and Plant Microbiology section at the School of Integrated Plant Science at Cornell University. Claire was a postdoctoral associate at BTI between 2010 and 2014 and uh, she worked in the lab of Dr. Uh, George Yander. Claire, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to take part in this project. Thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I would like to start this interview um, by asking you uh, about your educational background, especially if you could tell us what inspired you to study plants and later plants-insects uh, interactions. Um, yeah, so um, I didn't grow up in an academic background. I grew up in Missouri and um, I went to the University of Missouri to study computer science. Um, when I was in classes at University of Missouri, I realized quickly that um, these colleagues around me in computer science weren't really um, what I imagined myself um, doing or, or working on. And so I started um, working at um, research labs and taking science classes as well. And so I was in the work-study program, which was a um, program for financial aid. Um, and basically you would be paid to be um, working in a lab and it would cover your tuition as well. And so um, I started working in research labs. I worked in a biochemistry lab, a um, entomology lab as well as a neuroscience lab and when I started working in the um, entomology lab I really got excited and inspired you know all the people that were working in the entomology lab were um, very unique and just really excited about insects and what they were doing um, and I could see myself being in this community um, there I met Chris Ranger who was a graduate student at the time um, Chris Ranger really taught me about how you become a scientist. And I could, for the first time, see a path to becoming a scientist. He advised me on how you apply to graduate school. Um, how do you, you know, you don't have to pay to go to graduate school, like medical school. Um, he advised me on programs and um, he's still in good contact with him today too. He's a um, professor or a researcher at the United States Department of Agriculture currently and in Worcester, Ohio. So he was really, I think, the most influential person to get into science and becoming a scientist. After that, I did my master's at University of California in Riverside. Um, there I was co-advised. Um, I did my master's in entomology, but I was co-advised by Linda Walling in plant biology and Timothy Payne. Um, they were both great. They're very different advisors. Um, Timothy, or Tim, was very hands-off. Um, when he gave you comments on a manuscript, it was like, great, keep working on it. And Linda was very specific and gave lots of feedback. Um, and when my classes, I quickly realized that, you know, I really liked entomology and working with entomologists, but I didn't really understand the plant side or the how the plants were responding. And it was that part was very difficult to me. So I realized I wanted to go into more of the plant side. Um, and Linda really, you know, got me excited about plants and helped me realize this whole other world. And she's still a really important advisor now um, to this day. Like when I was moving to jobs or applying for jobs, you know, I talked to her still. Um, after that, I did my PhD at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and I did that in plant biology. And again, I chose to have co-advisors. I worked with Evan DeLucia in plant biology and May Barenbaum in entomology. Um, I really, again, like that dynamic of having different points of view and different um, interactions. And Evan and May, again, were very different. May was very busy, but also very excited. She really just exuded um, excitement for science. And she uniformly made you feel like you're, you know, what you're working on was so exciting and, and special. Evan was very, um, he, he revealed himself as a person. I feel like I knew him very well, and he I, he shared um, how to write grants, how to review papers. I feel like I learned a lot about writing. And, and at Illinois, I was in this collaborative environment. It was, um, my lab was in the Institute of 
<clears throat> genomic biology, which is, um, I don't know how many professors were in that lab, but it was a giant lab, maybe six or seven professors, we shared equipment. And this, you know, again, this community feeling, I think I just, that really got me excited about being a scientist and continuing in plant research. Um, and then after that, I ended up at BTI, Boyce Thompson Institute, where I worked with George Yender. Do you remember in which circumstances did you hear for the first time about BTI or who directed you towards the lab of, of George Yander? Yeah, so May, and when I was looking for postdocs, she had heard that he'd gotten a grant recently and he might be looking for postdocs. And so I reached out, um, he didn't have anything advertised, and just gave him my CV, my interests, and asked if he was hiring postdocs. And he got back to me right away, and. I went out and interviewed shortly after that. Okay, so it was a matter of choice. You sort of directed yourself or for this postdoctoral research, or did you try like many different things, uh, Claire, for postdoc training? Um, yeah, I reached out to a few different professors and I interviewed at a couple different positions. Um, I also interviewed at University of Michigan um, in Lansing. Um, yeah, and so I had some choices, but. Um, I, yeah, when I went out and interviewed at Boyce Thompson Institute, I was really excited about the experience. Um, I ha didn't know much about these research institutes, um, but I knew about a few of them, like the Danforth Center and um, the Nobel Foundation and um, Boyce Thompson Institute. But Boyce Thompson Institute was seemed a little different because it was right in the campus of Cornell. And so on my interview, I met not only lots of the scientists at um, BTI, but also some people from Cornell. Um, it just seemed like a very People were excited and they were very happy, and I, I felt like I could be very happy and excited there too. Every, everyone's working on um, plants, you know, in the whole building. Right. So uh, before we talk about the postdoctoral program in general and your training at BTI, tell us a little bit more about the Yanders lab and what kind of work did you do with him when you arrive? How this program sort of develop and. Uh, uh, what kind of grants you apply for? Yeah, um, you know, when I think back on that starting, George had a very big lab. He was very successful at writing grants. Um, however, we were in a very small physical space. We were on the fourth floor mm -hmm. um, next to Maria Harrison and down the hall from um, Frank Schroeder. The space was very small. We had to share um, pipettes and share spaces and hadn't actually been in a lab like that where it was so we we're on top of each other um, but also we you know you, again increased interactions and you learned how to work together and you got ideas from each other um, and so when I was there he had just finished he actually had a grant but they finished most of the objectives on the project and the grant was aimed at understanding the molecular mechanisms of um, aphid plant interactions. And George was very clever. He came up with this model system using Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the first plant that's genome was sequenced. So there was lots of different genetic tools that people had developed over the years. Um, and we could utilize all those tools to understand plant responses to aphids. Um, but again, most of the objectives were finished. So I was able to kind of start a new project, as long as it was related to aphids and um, plants. And so at the time, um, a paper had come out that in PNAS showing that plants <clears throat> that are infected with viruses are actually more attractive to the insects that can transmit them. Um, and in this paper, they show that the, these infected plants, more aphids will actually settle on them. But when they arrive, the plant um, is, uh, has more defense. And so they'll, they'll probe, attempt to feed, pick up viruses, um, and then decide that it's not a good host and move off. And you know, this was an exciting paper at the time, um, but they basically ended there. Um, they didn't determine any of the underlying mechanisms. How was the virus doing this? What was changing? Um, what plant pathways or changes in plant physiology um, were happening? And so <clears throat> my project basically was aimed at figuring this out using a different system. And so I found a virus that infects the Arabidopsis and I tested and determined that um, these aphids off, 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 also prefer to settle on these infected plants. And then I 
um, basically want to determine which viral proteins mediate this. So I cloned the coding sequence from each of the individual viral proteins from this virus, made transgenic plants or transiently expressed them, and then measured different changes in plant physiology <clears throat> um, to determine the single viral protein that was mediating it, which is um, nuclear inclusion A protein. Um, and that project I ever actually took on um, to my first professor position, and I actually am still working on it today. This For almost 10 years, I'm working on this single viral protein, and there's just more and more questions that keep coming up. So this project allow you to apply for a grant, like individual grant, or, or what happened with this idea? Um, yeah, so when I was in George's lab, we actually applied for a grant that can built off some of the preliminary data that I was generating. Um, and that funded my position at BTI for a few more years. And then as that grant was coming down, I wrote a second grant that was just a postdoctoral fellowship from the USDA. And for that, I expanded to look at other types of virus plant interactions with insects. And so the virus I was working on before just attaches superficially to the insect's mouth. It is an insect virus. It doesn't replicate inside the insect or enter the body. But for my new postdoctoral fellowship project, I um, expanded to look at viruses that actually will cross the gut um, into the insect's hemolymph and circulate in the insect's body and then have to travel back to the um, salivary glands and be secreted back into the plant. And it was shown that these viruses aren't replicating in the insect, but they are changing their behavior. Um, and so I guess basically I was starting to expand and develop this whole research program on viruses and microbes and how they influence plant insect interactions. Okay, so this sounds to me uh clear that uh, this kind of postdoctoral program can help people form a certain foundation for their uh, scientific career. Was that your case? You said you continue some of this research for the next 10 years. So, so was that a, a basic formation? And like, what are the most important aspects of this training that, that help you to develop your career? Like I mean, I, one thing would be, you know, having this kind of good leading um, investigator or uh, maybe learning how to prepare uh, application for grants in a specific way that helps you, you know, later to, to become an individual um, scientist that, uh, that is successful. Just which aspects of your training you consider the most important? Uh? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like in George's lab, it was the first time I really felt like an equal as a scientist and like I deserve this part, uh, this place at the table. You know, I am, you know, he respected me and made me feel like my opinions mattered. And I think that was a big deal. He would ask me to look at grants for him and, you know, we worked on grants together. Um, that was really important for me developing as a scientist. He also was really generous with his time and um, talking about science and ideas. Um, that helped me generate and start to develop my own ideas. Um, he also was really important for learning how to write grants. Um, for the first grant I wrote independently, you know, we talked about it days before it was due. We went through line by line, stayed up until probably 2 a.m. <laughs> giving me feedback, how to frame this, how can I make this a stronger grant application? And you know, I think it's, really amazing that he did that and I learned so much. And since then I've been very successful at writing grants. And I think a lot of that was from George's um, you know, teaching me how and, and showing me the way and framing and things like that. Um, and yeah, this did serve, you know, when I was finishing up my postdoc and started applying to jobs, I, you know, these, these ideas were collaborative. I was working with George and I, started developing new ones off that, but I had to talk to George and ask him about if I could keep working on it. And so I had a conversation with him asking, you know, I want to keep working on it. I have these new ideas to continue it. And he was very supportive of that. And, um, you know, I think that also was really important, like letting me take this part I kind of developed off to start my own lab and my own research area. That's great. So for BTI, apart from uh, research uh, in plant uh, field, an important part of the mission is also to educate and mentor people. 
like one third of uh, BTI em employees are postdocs and research associates. So I just wanted to hear from you, how would you evaluate the postdoc program in general terms? Uh, I wanted to mention one thing just for the record that um, in 2004 BTI established a postgraduate society so that's a little bit before the time you arrive uh, to BTI in 2010 but um, if you could just talk about uh, the postdoctoral postdoctoral program a bit more in general terms not just about the lab of of uh, Ander, but uh, how you felt in general how the postdocs are represented within BTI community and uh, yeah, like about uh, life in general during this training. Um, yeah, I, they had a strong postdoctoral um, association. We organized seminars, we met regularly. There's also just a large number of postdocs at BTI and there's a lot of interaction spaces. So um, you know, you got to work together and learn from each other. Um, there's just a really great community. Um, I definitely participated in <clears throat> organizing some seminars and there was a lot of, oh, also there was a lot of um, like workshops on career development, things like that. Um, I think that was really great. Um, and I do feel like, um, as I mentioned before, I, I feel like that it was probably a little bit, maybe more developed than some of the other postdoctoral associations I've seen. And, at least in my current lab. So like at UC Davis and at Cornell now, my own postdocs seem like they don't, it's not as strong or it's not as regular meeting. So BTI does that really well. Like they connect the postdocs and um, through this community, but also just working. Like anytime you came in, there was someone working on science. So you could, as you're struggling, get someone to talk to or ask or be inspired by. Um, also the collab, you know, I've been, the collaborative nature, a lot of the equipment was shared, which I really liked because um, someone who specializes in that could teach you about it. You also, when you're using it, might hear about their research, which is different than yours, that might inspire you. The um, greenhouses, greenhouses are all connected to the building. So when you're planting, you might see other postdocs or graduate students and talk to them about what's going on with their lives or the research. Um, yeah, I think they have a really, they do a really good job on building community. Um, and I think it's nice that they're on Cornell's campus too, because then you can also go and see all those seminars and meet other postdocs and graduate students. Yeah, I think since late 1990s, uh, BTI started to have many scientists with co-appointments with, you know, a scientist at BTI and adjunct professors uh, at Cornell. So, so I guess there were some synergies built already among the scientists. I don't know to what extent that also, also translates into educational programs. Do you, oh. do, you, do you think that this aspect of BTI being uh, situated on the, as an independent institution, but being situated on Cornell campus adds something to, to the training program? Oh yeah, I think that was key. I think that it adds so much and there's so much collaboration and so many options. You know, when I was interviewing, that definitely was a big decision. Um, just thinking about training, you're, I, at the time I didn't realize how important uh, BTI was for the undergraduate research programs. Um, you know, each summer we would have undergrads work with us and I was always excited to work with undergrads because that's basically how I became or got excited about science was working with Chris as an undergrad, leading my own research and learning about graduate school. Um, but BTI has this really amazing, um, I mean there's several research experience for undergrads through the NSF and the USDA now there's a program, um, so it's expanded and they have courses, they attend lectures, they give seminars at the end, or short little presentations on the research. I think that's something really special about BTI, how involved they are in that. And faculty from all over Cornell participate in that program um, and participate in that final symposium. Yeah. Would you like to add something, Claire, uh, here maybe about social life at BTI during your postdoc, before we move to your career after, the, after this experience? Um, yeah, BTI was 
I don't know. I mean, that was basically a large part of my life for a long time. You know, I was excited about science. I was learning a lot. Before that time, I really focused on chemistry and ecology and with George and at BTI, the exposure to all the different sciences. I started working more in genetics and molecular biology. And through that, you know, that was mediated largely through interactions with other scientists. Um, so, you know, we would work 10 seminars and then also we'd hang out afterwards. Like you might get beers afterwards or there was parties and things like that. And, you know, those are still people that <clears throat> I see at meetings, I'm excited to see. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really great time. Um, and they, you know, they also organized a lot of things too. I felt like they had, I can't remember quite really, but I feel like they had some kind of social committee or maybe even just dedicated people to organizing events because there's all kinds of things that we participated in. Yeah, somebody else mentioned to, to us some kind of Friday afternoon uh, gatherings, you know, in this lobby area. Yeah. That people had some some drinks and and the mixture of scientists and you know uh, people in training or even technicians everybody sort of gathering together so this is what I heard before yeah there's I definitely had I met lots of people it was a great experience I'd say okay Claire so let's let's move to your uh, career as a scientist after the postdoctoral program. Um, Tell us to what extent your career was influenced by, by this particular program at BTI and uh, what you did after, you know, 2014. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as, as I mentioned, it was really important for developing my first research focus, um, my long-term interests in molecular biology, um, and just also giving me the tools to ask ecologically important questions, but then looking at the underlying mechanisms. Um, so it was very important. Um, after BTI, I started a position at UC Davis. Um, the focus of my research program was again on um, how microbes alter the interactions between plants and insects, and then the underlying molecular mechanisms. Um, largely, I continued my work on plant infecting viruses <clears throat> and the preliminary data for my first grant, some of it came from my work at BTI, um, some of it I generated in my first year. Um, and so basically I built off that and expanded uh, on it with a NSF grant. Um, there I also started working <clears throat> um, with other microbes. And so my program's focuses on, again, microbes that alter plant and interactions. Most of it's on um, pathogens, um, plant infecting viruses. But a new area of the research is on um, beneficial microbes. And so I had undergrads in my <clears throat> lab. I always enjoy having undergrad researchers. And they were trying to come up with a idea for a independent project. and. I was um, talking with one, um, Andrea, and she was interested in organic farming and um, wondered, we'd read this paper that organic farming um, reduces pest populations. And in this paper, they showed the reason for this was because there was more natural enemies and insect diversity on in these farms. And so these natural enemies can keep the pests down. Um, however, in our conversation, we were talking and said, well, could these plants just be healthier maybe too. There's less pesticides, you know, shoot, her ideas were maybe they're getting better nutrient supplies and they're um, more resistant. And so based on this, we designed this project and several undergrads over the years helped lead it forward, but we collected tissue all over um, California from tomato farms and demonstrated through lab experiments and field experiments using transgenics and mutants that <clears throat> soil microbiomes on long-term organic farms do increase the resistance of processing tomatoes um, defense responses. Um, and this is critical for um, reducing pest populations. And so now we've continued that. Um, we uh, published on that and now we're working at Cornell in a similar area. So we, after UC Davis, I then moved to um, Cornell um, as an associate professor. Um, I was at Davis for about five years, and um, I've been at Cornell for about uh, three years, maybe almost four. 
And here I'm continuing it. So again, still working on plant viruses and this particular viral protein, Neopro, um, but then also this plant my beneficial microbe interactions work. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about your lab being placed in this particular school at Cornell of uh, integrate, integrated plant uh, science? Like, I understand there's five sections of uh, research related to plants. Could you just talk a little bit about the school when you're at, where your lab is? Um, yeah, it, you know, when, when I was moving to, deciding to move to UC Davis, or from UC Davis to Cornell, it was a really hard decision. Both schools were probably the best schools um, in plant science research. Um, and one thing that was particularly attractive to me was this um, integrative plant science school. Um, you know, it's this really great, all, multiple departments or sections of um, faculty working on plant sciences are all in the same school. They bring graduate school students in for interviews together. We have seminars at the same time each day. Um, you know, it was just very interactive again and collaborative. And also there's BTI there and the interactions between BTI. Um, so being in the School of Integrated Plant Sciences was just very attractive to me. Um, my research isn't just plant pathology. At UC Davis, I was in plant pathology, and here I'm in plant pathology and plant microbe interactions. You know, I was trained as an entomologist and a plant biologist, and then started working as plant, in plant pathology during my postdoc. So um, having access to all these other people and, you know, just structured access too was really beneficial and really attractive. Yes, yeah, so it, it sounds to me that people are just exposed to, to various fields of studies, right? And that maybe helps some kind of collaborative efforts or just understanding of the fields that, you know, are not specific to you, maybe branching out or, or sort of connecting with other scientists. What would you say is like the main positive aspect of, of building a school like, like that? Yeah, I think it's, you have, a, a built-in community or access to a community at each level. So like graduate students can talk to other graduate students in different fields, faculty too. Like we have a, a SIPS fa um, faculty Slack group where we ask for, can we use these reagents? Does anyone have this? Um, has, does anyone have an example of a grant to share? Um, and so just this structured system. You know, in UC Davis it was great too and there was other fields of plant science. Um, but it wasn't just built into the basic structure. Um, so I don't know, something about that's really, I think, important. And I, I still am very happy um, I transferred because of that. Okay, that's great. So Claire, I also could see in your CV that you were quite successful scientist, uh, receiving awards as early career scientist in um, molecular biology, right? And also middle career award. Could you talk a little bit about that? Which kind of research project uh, helped you to, to achieve this excellency? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the awards, I, I don't have anything special to say about the awards specifically. Um, you know, when I started applying for jobs too, I still wasn't sure if I wanted to be a professor or not, but then as I applied, I started getting really good feedback and lots of interviews, and so, um, I realized that I was pushing the field forward and um, really contributing. And so I think that those awards just recognize that, but Are they I guess- Are research or teaching or what kind of- It was like research, basically. Research. I, guess one, I guess one part that I think is interesting about it is the Phytochemical Society. Um, that was a um, professor at UC Davis, she, recommended me and um, nominated me for that. And you know that made, really made me start feeling like this community, right? There's this, this community of plant scientists. She, she rec knew me, was trying to support me, helping me build, build me up. Um, and then the other grant was the travel grant for ASPB, for um, women researchers. Um, you know, later in a meeting one time I met a professor and she recognized me and she said, oh, I was on that committee and I'm so glad that you got that travel award and see how great you're doing. Um, so, I, you know, I think that just this community of plant sciences, you know, across schools, how BTI um, weaves into it, I think that's maybe the most important part that it's just examples of people 
you're trying to build each other up and recognizing good science. And I, I really think that that's important for science too. And I try to run my lab that way as well. You know, we, I don't think it's, we need to be competitive, but collaborative and it's really important for moving forward. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there is some collaboration between BTI and uh, your school of uh, integrated uh, plant science. Could you discuss this example that you mentioned to me about uh, still collaborating with fr uh, one of the scientists at BTI, Frank Schroeder, and explain how this uh, works in practice, what kind of collaboration? Yeah, um, again, BTI is really great because um, well, I guess when I moved to UC Davis and I got my first startup, I was trying to decide what I needed and everyone bought the same thing and there's many copies of machines that we don't use that often. Um, and that was very different from BTI because these very expensive machines, one lab might have it and share it, um, and which is good for interactions. And when I was coming back to Cornell, um, I wanted to do some um, chemical analysis and uh, reached out to Frank because he has some really nice mass specs that are way too expensive for my lab to have alone. Um, and he allows researchers to use them, but just paying for costs basically. Um, so you have to get trained and then you can run the machine, you have access to BTI, you can work on it at night, whenever. And so basically, it's not a formal collaboration, but he's basically just letting people utilize this machine um, and paying costs. And, you know, I didn't have access to that kind of equipment at UC Davis, so this is a really big plus too. And then also just like, it really, really helps science, I think. Like it opens up so many possibilities for the types of questions we can ask. Um, and also just um, the ability for students to actually interact with the machine. So like there's facilities at Cornell where they have very nice machines too, but the students don't actually get to run the machines. Um, they provide the samples, someone does the processing and injects the sample. But at BTI and Frank's, you're actually learning how to run the samples. So hands on, hands yeah. on basically practice. Getting that experience, yeah. And it's, so I think it's amazing. And yeah, it's been a really great, Frank's been very um, helpful and open with us. And you know, it's not just us, other faculty on campus um, also work with Frank or use the machine. Um, and I think at Davis, I tried to get something going um, myself as well, a similar program. Um, it didn't really take off. Um, I was working with a chemistry professor, but I, you know, I, I hope there's more, more facilities like this um, that kind of, that come together. I know Chemical Ecology Corps at Cornell, they're trying to do a, a similar thing. It's not quite the same where you get to use the machine that yourself, but um, they will help you develop, like develop protocols with you. Um, but yeah, I think BTI is great for that. You know, I haven't been in other research institutes, so I don't know how different it is, but it definitely was a very great experience for me. Okay, Claire. And then I wanted to ask you at the end of our interview about uh, what you enjoy the most as, uh, in your work as a scientist, and also maybe talk a little bit about people who inspire you um, or motivated you to do science in a particular way. Just tell us about your philosophy of being a, a scientist and a teacher or doing training for other people. Um. Yeah, I think that when I was a postdoc and applying for jobs, I remember being worried about being able to come up with enough good ideas or um, research questions. I was like, oh, for the rest of my career, I'm gonna have to come up with more and more questions. But as I started getting further in my career, I realized that um, you know, each experiment, the results might not be what you expect, but it opens up a whole new set of experiments and questions that you probably couldn't ask before that. So complete different ways of thinking about things. Um, and that just continues to amaze me how, you know, we've been working on this single viral protein for almost 10 years and we just keep discovering new things about it. And then that allows us to ask new questions and come up with new questions. Um, and then on top of that, having people come into the lab of different experiences is just amazing because they c approach questions in different ways or they have different backgrounds and they might take projects and completely new directions as well. Um, 
And so I think that in general is really important to science in my lab is just working with lots of different scientists, um, seeing how things change, how different perspectives are important. Because um, if you're trained in a certain way, you might not be able to think about um, the experiments as someone else coming from a different background. Um, so that's been really important. And I think you know, that is really my favorite and most exciting part of um, research is just seeing um, how other people and how projects develop. Um, and the other part of your question? Could you tell us who inspire you as a teacher or another scientist you, you work with or, or cross uh, your ways with? Yeah, I think the, my biggest inspiration was probably Chris Ranger. Um, he was a graduate student at University of Missouri, and he was um, basically my uh, mentor, and I was an undergraduate researcher there. So he was the first um, research mentor that I worked with. <laughs> and um, he, he was in, inspirational to me because he really gave me the freedom and inspired me to feel like I could do science. He also um, taught me about the process and how you get to graduate school. He's just also very, like nothing seemed stressful to him. It was like, it's okay if things worked or didn't, it's like, okay, these are the next steps. Um, and he allowed me, like I wrote a first author publication as an undergraduate and it took me a really long time to finish it, but he was always like, okay, we'll just keep working on it, next draft. Um, so he was really important. Um, another person was George Jander. Um, again, George Jander was a scientist at BTI. He was the, I guess, my advisor for my first postdoc position or my only postdoc position. Um, and this was on, again, plant virus vector interactions. And George was really inspirational because for the first time, I felt like I really was treated as an equal and felt, you know, I am a scientist and my ideas matter. Um, and also just his, you know, his, um, he was very generous with his time and teaching me and um, how to write and how to conduct research and opening up all these different tools for me. Um, because previously, as I said, I mainly was using um, ecology and chemical ecology in my research. But at BTI, I learned all these tools of genetics and molecular biology. And still in my research now, I'm ecology, a little bit of chemical ecology, but a lot of it's really focused on the mechanisms and using tools of genetics and molecular biology. Could you also give us an idea, Claire, how big is your lab? and you know, what kind of lessons you apply in your relations with your trainees? Like, I wonder, do you work only with graduate students or also with undergrads? Just, just explain, explain your lab sort of. Uh, yeah, so we have a mix. We have undergrads, postdocs, and graduate students. And yeah, I think, um, I think it's, it's funny. I think that with experiences that I went through um, definitely influence how I am mentor now. Um, but also some things that were unclear to me, I feel like I try to make that more clear. Um, I make a kind of overview of how everything works. Like how do you apply, if you wanna to go to a meeting, how do you go to a meeting? Cause I didn't know how to do that. Or if you wanna, you know, you, you should take breaks. You should take vacation. How do you ask or bring up that you wanna take vacations? Cause those kind of things were very, I didn't know, no one told you about it. Like, is it okay to go home at Christmas? Things like that or holidays. Um, but yeah, I, I think having undergrads in the research is really important. Um, I, in most of the, my research, they, I had a kind of a starting project that kind of gave me a framework and helped me get into the, and understand the system. And then I was given the freedom to take it in new directions. Um, I try to do that with my students too in postdocs. Um, and I do really value their opinions and their um, input too. And you know, I try to make them feel like you know they're they're scientists. Their opinions matter, and so that's really important too. I think I got that in my experiences, and it may really be built up my confidence. So, all right, thank you so much. I think we're gonna stop here.